Right, well, grab your Bibles and uh, Bible survey tonight. So a bit of hard work and uh, a lot of listening to me. But uh, how else could we do it? Right, okay, now then, we, we're finished with Paul the Apostle now. Nah, bye-bye, Paul the Apostle. Uh, and we come on to the next section of the New Testament. And uh, what are called the pastoral letters? Now, these are letters that Paul wrote, so we're not really finished with Paul. Uh, they're not his letters to churches. But um, he's writing here two letters to a guy named Timothy and then a letter to someone called Titus. Now, <clears throat> they're called the pastoral epistles or the pastoral letters. And it's a bit of a bad name because um, it kind of paints the picture that Timothy and Titus, who were certainly leading churches, but calling them the pastoral letters kind of paints the picture that almost that they were the pastor of the church or something, that these were ministers of churches, which of course is not the case because there's no such thing as that in the Bible. Um, we're going to be seeing that what they actually were, were, were apostles who were leading churches for a period of time until the churches could be left on their own. Okay. So, so the actual phrase, the pastoral epistles, is not really, you know, sort of very helpful. Timothy and Titus were not pastors of churches, all right? They were apostles, okay? Now, just to, you know, to give you the background here, um, after the imprisonment in Rome, in Acts 28, remember Acts ends, you know, in Acts 28, you've got Paul imprisoned in Rome, and that was AD 63, okay? After, sometime after that, Paul was released and he embarked on his fourth missionary journey. And it was at that time that he left Timothy in Ephesus to lead the churches there, all right? And he left Timothy there to sort out a mess that had happened. Now, there's a lot of emphasis in the letter on elders. And at first reading, it can rather come across almost as if Timothy has been left in um, the Ephesian churches in order to lead them until they had their own elders. At first reading, that's what it looks like. And when we get on to Titus, we will see that is exactly the situation that Titus was in, but not so with Timothy. Now, this is eight years later after Paul had had his three-year stay with the Ephesians, and that's in Acts 19 and 20. So the point is, Timothy is with the Ephesian churches now, but this is eight years after he was there originally with Paul in Acts 19 and 20. And what's interesting, in Acts 19 and 20, we have the fact that Paul, when he leaves, he gathers the Ephesian elders to him. So the point is, this is not the story of new churches which are being led by an apostle until such time as they've got their own elders. The Ephesian church has had its own elders for at least eight years. And yet Timothy has been dispatched to go and lead them in order to sort out a mess. Now if you just go to Acts 20, I just want to show you something that Paul told the Ephesian elders eight years before this. This is Acts 20 and verse 29. And he says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So Paul actually prophesies that, one, people were going to come in from the outside into the Ephesian church and destroy it with false teaching, or at least to try and destroy it. Savage wolves. A lot of them probably wouldn't have even been Christians. They'd have been the Gnostics and all the other religions who wanted to kind of merge with Christianity. But then secondly, he said, from among your own selves, a problem was going to arise amongst the elders themselves. And this problem was that some of them were going to start distorting the truth and draw away disciples after them. Do you see the difference? Paul had taught them, as he taught all the churches, elders aren't there to cause people to be their disciples. Elders are there to help people be disciples of Jesus, to follow Jesus, not to follow the elders. What you've actually got here is a prophecy of coming hierarchy. 
the, you know, the false teaching that leaders would be in authority over the church and that you had to do what your leaders tell you in order to be right with God. And Paul actually prophesies this here. And so I think it's possibly very likely that the mess has now happened and that Timothy has been dispatched to the church in order to help them clear up the mess that they're experiencing, probably having had existing eldership go bad. Not all the elders, but some of them. And remember, this is multiple churches. But some of the elders will have gone bad, and so someone is needed to go in and sort out the mess. And that is what falls to Timothy. And so he goes back to these churches to spend time with them to get them through this. Now, we'll, we'll be back to that shortly, okay? Okay. Um, let me just give you a bit of background on Timothy himself before we actually turn to the letter. He, he was from Lystra, which, which is modern-day Turkey now, and uh, he had a Greek father and a Jewish mother. Um, we know from his second letter, which we'll move on to next time, that he had been taught the Old Testament from birth. So at least his mother was a faithful, you know, sort of believer who raised him in the Jewish scriptures. And he joined Paul in his travels uh, back in Acts 16 and verse 1. Okay. Now, Paul is writing this letter to him from Greece. The letter to Titus was written from the same place, around the same time, all right? Um, and the date is around AD 64, 65, okay? And what we're going to see is that the main push behind this letter is the importance of refuting false teaching, giving instructions on certain practical aspects of church life, and also dealing with the qualifications of elders. That's the main push of the letter. So, so that said, let's, let's actually dive in and, and, and start seeing it. Um, now, obviously it starts off from Paul, he says, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Saviour and Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith. I mean, that, that's the kind of relationship that Paul had with this guy. Timothy was much, much younger than Paul, young enough to be his son, and it was very much a father-son relationship that they had. But remember, Timothy was one of the people on Paul's apostolic team. And the way that the apostolic teams worked is that most of the time they would be together, they lived and travelled together, they were mostly single men, but there were times when any one individual might have been sent off somewhere on their own just to look after churches for a period of time, and then they would have joined back up with the team at a later date. Um, you know, but anyway, this relationship between Paul and Timothy is very much um, father and son. Now, if we read verse 3, immediately you'll see why I've said what I've said about why Timothy is there and elders going wrong and Paul's prophecy back in um, Acts 20. He says, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, well, that's, that's Greece, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myth and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work which is by faith. So he says, look, you're there to stop people teaching false teaching any longer. Can you see? It's been going on for a period of time. And so the point is, whether it is the elders, and I think that that's, you know, the, 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 that prophecy of Acts 20 is being fulfilled, but whether that's the case or not, we can certainly see that the Ephesian church was having a real problem with false teaching that had got in amongst themselves. And so, you know, Timothy is sent in there to put a stop to it. And, and look how strong this is. Command them to stop. This, this isn't let them have their say and stuff like that. False teaching destroys the church. False teaching can even destroy individuals' Christian lives. And I've said here so many times before, when you read the Gospels, the, the single one issue that Jesus taught more about than any other one issue was money, all right? And the dangers of money, okay? When we turn to the epistles, the letters written to churches, then there's one thing that they're, we're warned against more than any other one single thing, and it's false teaching. There are more warnings in the New Testament against the dangers of false teaching than any other one subject. And Paul talks here about myths and endless genealogies. These guys, they'd have all had their, their pet 
doctrines, their little pet false teachings. And but the point is that you know it's 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 nothing to do with scripture, and it, it just promotes controversies, and it just causes people to wander away into meaningless talk. You know that people end up going on all these you know these speculations and stuff like that, and rather than sticking with the plain word of scripture false teaching gets people going all around the houses and you know absolutely all over the place you know like as I often say you know you blow up a balloon and you let it go and it goes and it flies all around the room the moment Christians get into false teaching that is what starts to happen to them and they're all over the place okay and and he says basically with these teachers he says look they don't know what they're talking about basically and false teachers don't know what they're talking about and, uh, you know, the important thing is that everything, all teaching, must be tested by Scripture. And there are always people who, who want to wax eloquent. You know, they're usually good at public speaking. Nothing wrong with being good at public speaking, but normally you're fine with these guys. They're, they're good at talking and stuff like that, and they can go on and on and on and on. And it's all, it's all words and, and stuff like that, and it's just an absolute waste of time. And so what Paul says, that, 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 that by way of contrast, that... That, that God's work is, is love and it's a pure heart and it's a good conscience and it's sincere faith. And he says, look, the law is good, but you've got to use it properly. So you can twist the law. And of course, you know, we've seen uh, you know, a few weeks ago when we were doing um, you know, the hermeneutics thing about how to interpret the Bible. Again, the New Testament warns against people who, what Paul said, distort the truth. And elsewhere, the Bible talks about people who twist the scriptures. They'll twist them round, taking stuff out of context, not mentioning the verses that don't fit. Do you see what I mean? Doing all their false teaching. And, uh, you know, so really what they do is rather than bringing teaching out of the Word of God, they're imposing their own ideas on the Word of God by taking everything out of context. And so, you know, sort of Paul says, look, that's, all, all that is absolutely crazy and you've got to, you know, to get rid of it you you can't have that going on in the church because uh, it will just um you know sort of destroy ev everyone and then then paul does one of his you know like or, or you know like i thank the lord for and and he, he he thanks the lord for appointing him to his service and and he says especially in the light that he used to persecute the church um he was violent and, and, and he said that, that, that he was a blasphemer. That's interesting. We'll, we'll come back to that shortly. But he said he acted in ignorance, he acted in unbelief, and God showed mercy on him and had grace poured out on him, and therefore he came into the faith and the love which are in, in Jesus. And then he says that, that Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and then he says that, that he, he was the worst. He says... Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. And, and uh, notice, Paul didn't say, I was the worst. He said, I am the worst. Whenever you get this stuff about, you know, sort of, can you get beyond sin? Can Christians stop sinning? Well, certainly Paul didn't consider he'd done. He said, I am the worst of sinners. Not I used to be, and God set me free, and I don't sin anymore. But Paul considered himself to be the worst of sinners. And that was a mark of the man. That was the mark of Paul. He, he knew that, that outside of the grace of God, he was a sinner like everybody else. And he was a humble man, and, and that, that's what made him safe. He wasn't one of these guys who was all together and lording it over everyone. And What? You still have struggles in your Christian life? What's wrong with you, mate? He wasn't like that. Because Paul knew of the struggles in his own life. And, um, you know, and he said that but precisely because he was such a sinner, that all, all the more God, through his mercy, has displayed his patience. You know, what Paul is saying, in effect, is, look, he says, I've been made an example to those who are going to believe and receive eternal life. And what he's saying, look, if God, if God can have his way in me, God can do it in anyone. You see, that, that, that's what Paul is saying there. And uh, let's, let's just read verse uh, 17, because he, he ends this just, just, just with praise to God. And he says, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. So that's, uh, Paul often does that in his letters, doesn't he? He has a little praise session in the middle of them. And uh, then he, he, he returns to instructing Timothy, and he tells him that, 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 that Timothy has, has got to... To, to be faithful to the prophecies that were once given about him, okay? And he says, look, you've, you've got to fight the good faith, 
and you've got to, sorry, fight the good fight, and you've got to hold on to faith and a good conscience. Now, there's two things there. You've got to hold on to faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You've got to hold on believing the truth of the Word of God. But also, you need a good conscience. Because you can believe the truth of the Word of God, but not live according to it, and therefore not have a good conscience. And Paul says, Timothy, you've got to make sure that both those things are going hand in hand. That you're holding on to faith, and that you're doing it in a good conscience. And then what he says is that some, and obviously he's talking about Christians, he says some have rejected these and shipwrecked their faith. Now that's shipwreck. What's a shipwreck? A ship that was once quite capably sailing around on, on the surface of the water and then it hits rocks or something happens to it and it sinks. All right. So he's not saying these guys aren't Christians anymore, but he's saying that there were those who, because they let go of faith, because they let go of a good conscience, they stopped being honest before God. They stopped living in repentance. You know, they, they stopped living in truth. Not just the truth of what the Bible says, but the truth of being a person of truth. Honestly assessing ourselves. And as a result of that, they shipwrecked their faith. And they did it by getting into false teaching. And he actually names some of them. He says, look, some have rejected these and have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander. Now, when we get into the second letter, we get ideas of the false teaching that they were into. And they were saying that the resurrection was already past, as opposed to being future at the second coming. But it's not particularly important what it is they're into, but it's the point that they've shipwrecked their faith but they've done it by false teaching. And even though they've shipwrecked their faith, they're still pushing this and teaching other people. You see what I mean? And Paul's saying, no, look, the, you know, guys, people like that are not to be looked to. They might look good, but they've shipwrecked their faith because they're bringing you false teaching. And what's interesting, he says that I've handed them over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Now, with Paul, the language of handing over to Satan is putting out fellowship. Paul has disfellowship with these guys. Paul has said, I'm not having anything to do with you because you're not repentant. And he's making sure that the church knows that Paul, that he won't have anything to do with them. Okay, But when he says that handed them over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme, now we tend to think of blasphemy purely as when people handed them over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Now we tend to think of blasphemy purely as when people take the name of the Lord in vain. Now that is blasphemy, but that's only part of it. In the Greek, the word blaspheme simply means to speak injuriously of. It's when you do someone a disservice, like if you slander someone or if you misrepresent them. And earlier on, we saw that Paul, when he was talking about when he was an unbeliever, he said um, that, 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 that even though I was once a blasphemer, and yet Paul was a Pharisee. So when Paul said that he was a blasphemer, he wasn't meaning that he was uttering blasphemy in the sense of taking the name of the Lord in vain. Of course not. He was a Pharisee. What he's talking about is that because back then, as an unbeliever and a Pharisee, he was teaching error. False teaching is blasphemy. Whether taught by unbelievers or here with Hymenaeus and Alexander, taught by believers. And the reason, the reason that serious false teaching is blasphemy is because it speaks injuriously of the Lord. It misrepresents him. It slanders him. Because you've got what God says about himself in the Bible. You've got what God says is true. And then false, te false teaching comes on and says, no, that's not true of the Lord. This is true of the Lord instead. Instead, you see, and that's blasphemy. It's speaking injuriously of the Lord. And so here, um, you know, sort of Paul, and he's not frightened to name names. You know, this idea that you never name names, absolutely not. As far as the New Testament church was concerned, if there were people whom the churches were better off being protected from, they wouldn't hesitate to name names. They say, look, here is a name. Don't have anything to do with them. They're going around stirring up trouble. They're going around doing false teaching. Wow, that's, that's tough. But how else can you protect the church from false teaching, which is so important that we do, unless we're prepared to take the measures here that we see Paul telling Timothy to? Right, now then, in chapter 2, uh, Paul moves into giving some um, instructions 
uh, you know, to do with their church life. I went, you know, sort of like when they're coming together, um, you know, sort of like actually as 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 churches. And uh, and he says that um, he says that uh, that prayers and intercession and thanksgiving um, should be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Now then, we come now to a sticky verse. All right. And, uh, you know, it's uh, a sticky verse, and I'm going to cover it from both angles. Because, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure where, where I am on this, what my understanding is. But he talks about that this is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So, obviously, on this verse, we seem to have a statement that God does indeed want everyone to be saved and has at least made provision for them. Okay. Now then, there are other scriptures in the Bible that would tend to suggest that that isn't the case. And so there's a dilemma here. Um, and, you know, it's just good to understand the two different ways that this can be understood. Because, first of all, if this is a statement, I'm not saying it isn't, but if this is a statement, <clears throat> all right, that God wants all men to be saved, we got to ask the question, what does the word all mean? Now, I'm not playing with words. Because in the Greek, the word all doesn't always mean all. By which I mean this. Sometimes it means all, as in absolutely everyone. But at other times it means all, as in all kinds of. Now, let's just go back, because the word occurs earlier when it says, um, and sort of, he says, to, to make intercession for everyone, for all, all right? Now, that's the same word. So, the argument here would go, that if it says that God wants all men to be saved, if that all men, if all there means absolutely everybody on the face of the earth, then that would mean that in the verse prior, Paul has said to them, you must pray for absolutely everybody on the face of the earth, which would be ridiculous. How can any one person, how can any one church be praying for everybody on the face of the earth at any one time. So that would suggest that all, as in I want you to pray for all men, in all kinds of. So be praying for kings, be praying for, you know, those in authority, be praying for these, all kinds of. So if it means all kinds of there, then when Paul says that God who wants all men to be saved could also mean all kinds of. All kinds of men. I, the, you know, the big, the small, the rich, the powerful, the poor. See what I mean? So the point is that on this verse, yes, it might be a straight statement just that God wants absolutely everyone to be saved and has made provision for them. Or it could equally be, when you do the Greek, that this is simply talking about all kinds of. But in exactly the same way that we're to pray for all different kinds of people, from kings downwards, in the same kind of way, God wants all different kinds of people to be saved. Um, you know, and, and of course, the news that so many Christians couldn't get their heads round was that that included the Gentiles. Now, Paul got his head round it, but many of the Christians in the first generation were Jews, and they had a real job getting their heads round the fact that salvation could be for Gentiles. Also, it's interesting that when he says, for there is one God and one man, and one mediator between God and man, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. Now again, is that all men that a ransom absolutely everyone, okay, or is it all kinds of? Now what's interesting, the Gospels twice have Jesus talking about himself, giving himself as a ransom. Jesus never said that he would give himself as a ransom for all. Jesus said he would be giving himself as a ransom for many. It's only Paul who says all. But here, if the context, <coughs> excuse me, if the context is all as in all different kinds of people, then this would fit. So, all I'm saying, depending on where you are on the free will predestination debate, this this verse isn't necessarily as conclusive one way or the other as as, as it may appear. And we'll be back to another bit about that uh, later on in 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 the in the letter. Right, so <clears throat> he moves on, and he says that he was <clears throat> you know, appointed a herald and an apostle and to be a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. Remember, Paul taught the true faith. He's combating false teaching. So how do you know if something is false teaching? But if it goes against what the apostles taught, it's false teaching. 
that's the test of scripture, you see. Paul all the time saying, I am teaching the truth. And you remember that Peter, um, in his letter, uh, said about Paul. He says, now Paul does write some hard things. He says that ignorant and unstable men twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. So again, you know, sort of like Peter is confirming that what Paul was writing was scripture, what Peter was writing was scripture, and he was, says that whenever people come along and try and twist scripture, they're trying to get round the bits that they don't like, and they're distorting it, and they're taking things out of context, always a sign that something bad um, is, is, is going down. Anyway, he, he now addresses some practical matters of when the church comes together. And he says, like, for instance, I want men to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. So he's saying, obviously, when a church comes together, there's going to be prayer. You know, and Paul, you know, often he, he, he'll address each group of people with the bit of truth they need. And what he's saying to the men folk here is, look, without anger and without disputing, I no fights between yourselves. Often, when Paul addresses husbands, he says, look, love your, wife, love your wives, and don't be harsh with them. You see the point? That's what men often need to hear. Don't be angry. Don't be harsh. Don't be arguing. Don't be fighting. That's the male, you know, the male kind of warrior type thing. And men folk have always got to make sure that we're more and more becoming people of peace, that we're not harsh, and especially with our wives, obviously. So he says, look, yeah, you men, I want you to be lifting up holy hands in prayer, but without anger without disputing because obviously I mean you know to be praying to the Lord with anger and disputing in your heart what's the point he ain't listening anyway he's just saying you've got to repent of that anger and disputing you see then he has a word with the women and he says I want them to dress modestly with decency and propriety not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes when you when you do the Greek here he's not forbidding um, you know sort of like having braided hair he's not forbidding jewelry what he's saying is that, that, that he wants to make sure that the women are not parading themselves with those things. That's the push behind it. So he says, I want women to dress modestly, obviously not to kill. Um, and he says, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. So what he's saying is that, yeah, modest appearance, and obviously... That does differ from culture to culture. It, you know, it differs from area to area, you know, sort of like, you know, even in, you know, different parts of the country. You know, I mean, we go to different places um, in the States where certainly these groups take modesty very seriously indeed, but they all have different understandings of what modesty is, which is fair enough. The important thing is that all the time we're true to our conscience and our best understanding of Scripture. But obviously, you know, wherever you draw the lines, no one's going to dispute that women ought to address modesty. Of course they were. So, you know, I mean, you know, it shouldn't be, you know, the ladies coming to church like a fashion parade or something like that. And certainly not with any, you know, sort of like, you know, showing off the, the, the rich jewels or anything like that. And then he, he goes on to say that, um, you know, that a woman should learn in quietness and submission. And this is where he says that women ought not to be, te or not ought not to be. He said, I do not you know, I forbid women to be teaching. And there are two things that a woman isn't meant to do in the church. One, to teach, and two, to have authority over a man. There's two things here in the Greek. It's not one thing. Paul isn't saying, I don't permit a woman to teach in such a way as to have authority over men. And, you know, Christians who are feminists who try and say it's okay for women to teach, they say, oh, no, it's okay for women to teach as long as she's not being in authority over a man. Well, that's not what Paul says. He says, I do not put, permit a woman, one, to teach, and two, to have authority over a man. See, and he gives his reason for it. And he says, the reason is firstly that Adam was formed first. That simply means headship. The fact that Adam was created first meant that he was Eve's head. So the point is, God, even before sin came into the world, God created Adam and Eve to have this partnership whereby the husband was the head. And also, what we've got to see here as well, that this is nothing whatsoever to do with the culture of the day. You, you get Christians trying to say, oh yeah, but that was, that was Paul's culture. That was just, you know, that's just what, what Paul believed back then. That's what they believed. Well, my question is, so what else was Paul wrong about? What else were the Bible writers wrong about? You see what I mean? Then you've got a Bible that isn't 
you know, in, inspired. It's crazy. But the point is, Paul specifically goes out of his way to say the reason that women ought not to teach or have authority over men in the church is because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. It's totally transcultural. It had nothing whatsoever to do with the culture of Paul's day, but it had everything to do with what happened in the Garden of Eden. And when we address these issues now, it has absolutely nothing to do with the culture of our day, but it has everything to do with what happened back in the Garden of Eden. And then he says, look, the woman was deceived and became a sinner. Now that sounds there like he's blaming Eve. If you read Romans, Paul makes it very clear he blamed Adam, if you see what I mean. But the point is that he's simply saying that is what happened when Eve moved outside of, of real oneness with her husband. You see, she went off on her own and Satan got her, if you see what I mean. So Eve had made her mind up before Adam got there. You see the point? She didn't say, oh darling, what do you think about this? You see, she made her mind up before Adam got there and then Adam book that he was said oh that sounds like a good idea darling give me some too can you see what i mean so adam completely you know abrogated his responsibility as the head of the house and, and the blame lies with him the sinful nature passes through men not through women jesus it's one of the reasons why jesus had to have been born of a virgin if jesus hadn't have been born of a virgin he'd have had a sinful nature and Jesus was sinless, you see. So anyway, the point is here that Paul is just outlining that when it comes to order in the church, that obviously teaching and, and anything of authority and leadership is, is, is very much for the menfolk. Then you get this rather strange verse here, verse 15, and he says, But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness with propriety. Now, I've said many times before, when you get the word saved, don't just think of being saved from the lake of fire. <laughs> All right. The word saved, salvation, just means to be rescued. And to be rescued from what, you find out from the context. We're going to be see the, seeing this a bit later on in something else that Paul writes to Timothy. So the point is, he's not saying here that men are saved through faith in Christ, but women are saved through having children. That's not what he's talking about at all. It's delivered. He says that women will be delivered through or delivered in childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness with propriety. Now, I've, I've, I've come across three possible meanings for that that people put forward. And I'm, I'm happy to tell you which, which I think is the, uh, the one. Um, fir firstly, there are those who say what Paul is talking about is, 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 is the woman, in, in distinction from wanting to lead and teach and stuff like that, he's talking about finding fulfilment simply as being a wife and a mother. So, so that's, that's the first some Christians say they think that's what Paul is meaning, talking about how the woman is going to find fulfilment, not in church leadership, not in teaching, but ultimately simply in being a wife and mother. So that's the first one. Um, the second one is it's a, a very obscure reference to salvation through the birth of Jesus, because obviously Jesus was born of woman. See, So some say it's an oblique reference to that. Fine. Um, the third one, and this, this is the one that I, I veer towards, it, it's a promise of safe childbirth. It, it's saying that, you know, the woman will be delivered, kept safe in childbirth, if she, you know, you know, if she trusts the Lord. So I, I think, you know, and, and, and of course, back infant mortality was unbelievable back then. I mean, we, we take it for granted now that, you know, that birth is a pretty safe kind of thing. Well, then it wasn't believe you me. So anyway, I, I kind of take it that it's that, but you, you, you take your pick. Now then, when we come into chapter 3, now Paul dives in with all this stuff about elders and deacons. Okay. Now obviously I, I don't you know, sort of need to go greatly into the difference between elders and deacons. Deacons were, were appointed for individual administrative tasks, completely different from elders. It wasn't church leadership. The deacons were simply, you know, so, you know, sort of like, you know, back in Acts 6 when, you know, the Grecian widows were being neglected. 
it's like you know seven men were appointed specifically to take on that task because the apostles couldn't do it they were overstretched so you know but nevertheless there were standards for deacons and going back to if I'm right in what I say that the reason that Timothy has been dispatched to the Ephesian church is because eldership has gone wrong and some of the elders who were recognised have been doing false teaching, and Paul has even had to put some of them out of fellowship, but obviously they're, they're staying put. You know, I mean, a dreadful mess. So it's understandable that, that there would be this big emphasis on the qualifications of an elder, okay? So he says, look, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Because presumably, if some of the elders have needed to be de-elderized, or whatever that means, I mean, that, 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 I mean you know, I'm not quite sure what happened, but, you know, but say that some of them are being, you know, sort of not recognized as elders anymore, then they're going to need new ones. Or maybe some of them have even gone out from the church. I don't know. But the point is, he says, look, there's nothing wrong in desiring to be an overseer. And remember, overseer, bishop, pastor, shepherd, elder, presbyter, synonymous terms for the same people, all right, okay. And so, you know, and they were all just locally raised up, recognized from within the church they were going to lead, all right. So anyway, he says it's a noble task. And he, he, he goes through the, um, you know, he, he, he goes through the qualifications. And he says that the husband of but one wife, the, uh, he says they must be above reproach, and then the ensuing list is what he means by that. I mean, no one is absolutely beyond reproach, are they? But beyond reproach, and then here's the way you'll know if they are. So he starts off with husband of one wife, although the Greek says a one-woman man. That's, that's what it says in the Greek. And I think the push here, it's not, it's not talking about stuff like divorce. It's talking about one of the problems the early church had was polygamy. Um, you know, there were lots of people in the ancient world that had more than one wife. It was quite normal. And when they got converted, obviously, the church didn't say, well, look, now you've got to divorce three of your wives and just keep one. That would be ridiculous because that would be to create more evil than it was solving. And it would be dreadfully unfair on the women involved. So if, if they had gone guys, you know, men in the church with two, three, four wives or whatever, they didn't say divorce all but one, so these guys had multiple wives. But the point was that what the early church did, they said, but when it comes to recognising an elder, you must only recognise someone with one wife, because otherwise you'll be giving out the wrong signal, you'll be saying it's still okay to have more than one wife. You see what I mean? So the point is, if someone got converted or came into the church and they already had more than one wife, well, that was fine. You know, they had more than one wife. But if someone in the church who was already married then, then said, I'm going to marry wife number two, they'd have said, oh, no, you're not, mate. Oh, well, I'm going to. Oh, well, you'll be out then. Yeah. <laughs> see what I mean? <laughs> so the point that elders had to have just one wife or the wrong signal would have gone out about polygamy. You know, but obviously, one woman man, you know, you're nevertheless, you know, talking about someone who's completely in accord with, you know, with what God teaches about marriage, okay? So, um, he, he says that, and then he runs through the list, I won't go into it in detail, but he says temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, and not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. And of course, we've done all this in detail on the Church Life series and other, other stuff that we've done. He says, not a lover of ma money. He says, he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? So, a good family man, if you see what I mean. And, and you know, these qualifications, obviously, you know, are, are, are completely mandatory. He says he mustn't be a recent co convert or he'll become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Now, what's interesting about this is that, that, that these qualifications for an elder I mean, they're virtually nothing to, well, they're nothing to do with having qualifications from theological seminaries. There's no such thing as that in the early church. You know, there's nothing to do with, you know, how good is he at preaching or something like that. Now, an elder needs to be able to teach. It doesn't mean that every elder's got to be a full-blown Bible teacher, but obviously an elder has got to be able to teach. But can you see, this is character. This, this is a man who's proven himself in the Christian walk 
over many years to people. And of course, the point is that when it comes to the church recognising these qualities in someone before they recognise him as an elder, can you see it presupposes they've known him well for a long time? I mean, how could they know if his family's in order? They could only know that if they've been in his house a lot. Can you see what I mean? Any, any, any minister of a church can turn up on Sunday and everything looks great because no one knows what his life is like during the week. Can you see what I mean? That, that's the reason why, you know, sort of like church leadership is by eldership. The idea of bringing in experts from the outside that you don't know from Adam is ridiculous. You can't begin to know if they are men of this quality, can you? You don't know them well enough. And you might go to a church, oh, for three or four years, and there's the pastor of the church, and every Sunday you see him up there preaching away. You don't know what condition his family's in. You see what I mean? You don't know what he's, you know, like in his daily life. All this presupposes that intimate relationship between people that is obviously going to happen when churches are numerically small and house-based. Obviously, this is leadership for what the Bible teaches about churches. But this sort of leadership is irrelevant to unbiblical churches. They have a completely different type. And so what we're seeing here, the push behind leadership is character. And when you look at the qualifications of an elder, all you're really looking at is a definition of a, of a brother leading a mature Christian life. That's, that's fundamentally all you're talking about. Then he does a thing about the deacons and he says for them, now, they're not leaders, but even so, they're given positions of responsibility in the sense that they might be given money. You know, I mean, the church would, you know, like in one area, might raise money for churches in another country that were having famine. Well, these guys might be given the money to take, so they had to be really trustworthy. So, obviously, there was a high standard for them as well. And then in verse 11, it says... In the same way their wives are to be women worthy of respect. Now, in the Greek, there isn't a word for wife. There's just a word for woman. You have to find out whether it's talking about wives from the context. Some people try and say this verse is a reference to deaconesses. I don't see that, because then in verse 12, he goes back to talking about a deacon and saying he must be the husband of one wife. And I think that what it's talking about here is just that women of note in the church need to have a standard about them as well. Can you see what I mean? But maybe it does, you know, sort of like, maybe it is talking about the elders' wives or the deacons' wives. Because obviously, if an elder has got to manage his own household well, then if he had a, a wife who, who the church was saying, well, she's not a godly woman, well, that obviously that would disqualify him from leadership. So obviously, if you're going to recognise an elder or a deacon, you've got to take their wife into account, if you see what I mean. So maybe, maybe it's that, OK? And then he goes back to say that deacons must be one women men as well, and that they, they have to have served well and have an excellent standing. And, um, and, and, and he says, I hope to come to you soon, and I'm writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. What's God's household? It's family. Church, meeting in a house, family, extended family of God's people. And he says, which is God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And so can you see there this, this kind of emphasis on this is what elders should be like and very possibly it's because as I say the existing eldership that went back at least eight years prior to this we know from the prophecy that Paul gave them that something was going to go wrong with their eldership and I think that this is Timothy going into the churches to sort it all out and very possibly to raise up a completely new eldership you know but that's you know that's basically why why he's there and then you get this this kind of you know, sort of people think this was probably a hymn that, that they sang. And he says, Paul says, Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was what the commentators think is an, an early hymn, like a chorus, and Paul's just kind of uh, writing it down there. Okay, right, so we move now on to um, chapter 4, and again back to this theme, this massive theme of false teaching. And what does he say? Again, prophecy, another prophecy, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, that's a prophecy, what's going to happen in later times? Some will abandon the faith. Well, you can't abandon what you weren't into. Can you see what I mean? The greatest danger in the church is not unbelievers getting in pretending to be believers. 
They're the wolves. That come. That's not the greatest danger of the church. The greatest danger in the church are genuine believers going bad. That's the danger. And especially if they go bad because they're pushing false teaching because there's something scripture teaches that they don't like, they don't agree with. And rather than bowing down to the authority of scripture, to the authority of Jesus, they're doing a rebellion thing, but dressing it up and twisting scripture to make it look like they're you know, actually right. And so Paul says, look, deceiving spirits are going to get hold of believers. You know, believers are going to be deceived by the doctrine of demons, as some translations say. And it says, look, such teaching comes through. Now, obviously, it's demonic in origin, but how? what's the mechanism? I mean, yeah, at any point, Satan could use me. But what must happen before he can? There has to be a coat hanger of sin in my life that I'm not repenting of that he can get in through. You see what I mean? So Paul says, such teaching comes through hypocritical liars. Now, that's not a very politically correct thing to say, especially about Christians. But Paul said it. Whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Now, what's he talking about there? What's, what's conscience? Conscience is when you respond to knowing that you're doing something wrong. Now, if you, if you have skin that's been burned, all right? So if you've got a, you know, like a hot iron and it sears your skin. Now, when that skin heals and you've got new skin there, there aren't any nerves in it. There's no feeling in it. So it doesn't work anymore. So what Paul is saying, that if Christians get to the point where whether it's with sin in their personal lives or pursuing false teaching or whatever, where their consciences are showing them that they're wrong. And of course, We've seen this again and again, you know, often the, you know, sort of like, you know, there's that, 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 that literary saying, isn't there? Methinks the, the lady doth protest too loudly. You see what I mean? And we all know what it is to see Christians desperately trying to get across to everyone that they're right. And it's the very evidence, really, that they know that they're wrong. But they go against their consciences so much that eventually their consciences stop working. You see what I mean? And Paul says that once Christians get into that condition, well, that is when Satan can get in. Because <laughs> they've willingly and willfully gone against the Bible, they've willingly and willfully carried on in some kind of sin, ignoring what people have said to them, ignoring all correction, and they've hardened themselves in that. And then they get to the point where they can become vessels. I'm not talking necessarily about being demonized in the sense of demons getting into them or anything like that. But remember, you know, when Peter said to Jesus, no, Jesus, you're not going to die. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. See, that was Satan speaking through Peter. He says, these are the thoughts of men and not God. And that's what happens when Christians get seriously into false teaching and stuff like that. And then he gives examples of the kind of stuff they were up against. The false teaching could be anything. But they were up against people forbidding marriage. Now, anything that forbids marriage is wrong, all right? And uh, telling them to abstain from certain food. This is kind of an asceticism. The idea that if you're really harsh on your body, that will sanctify you, which of course isn't true at all. So, the, at least one of the false teachings they're up against here is that they're being told that marriage is wrong and they're, they're being told they've got to abstain from certain foods. This is probably from a Jewish origin in the church, I would imagine. And, you know, but, but, but that's, that's just an example of some of the stuff they were up against. It can be different in every church and different at every point in, um, in history. And so what he says then is he says, look, if you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus. Now, that's, oh, that dreadful word, minister. You see, Christians, they read that word and they think that, 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 that Timothy was a minister, like the minister of a church. In the New Testament, the word minister translates the Greek word for servant. Servant. And the trouble is we've changed the meaning of Christian words with false teaching. So, for instance, Anglican Christians, they read the word bishop in the Bible. What do they think of? They think of Anglican bishops. You know, unaware of the fact that in the New Testament, the word bishop was simply a synonymous term for an elder. That's all it was. 
No such thing as bishops in the New Testament like you get, say, in the Anglican Church. So we need to be careful here. We read back our false teaching into the Bible. So when he talks about Timothy being a minister, he's not talking about a minister like of the Baptist Church or something like that. He's a servant. He says, then you'll be a good servant brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. So he's saying, look, all the time, Timothy, you've got to be at war against false teaching. And then he goes on to say, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Now, again, here, look, the sarcasm is dripping from Paul's lips here about false teaching, isn't it? Is he respectful of it? No. Does, does he take it seriously? He says, it's myths. He says, it's old wives' tales. It's kind of up there with Jesus as an astronaut. Yeah. It's nonsense. Do not entertain false teaching. Simple as that. He says, rather, train yourselves to be godly. That's, that's, that's the thing that Paul is saying. And then he says, look, physical training is of some value, yes. But he says, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So here, what is he saying is an absolutely crucial element in being godly. It's abiding by true teaching. Do you see the point? The moment you get into false teaching, godliness is compromised. Now, he then goes on to another one of his sayings, and I've got to come back to what I was saying now about the verse earlier, whether all means all or just means all kinds of. Because now, he says, this is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. For this we labour and strive, that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the saviour of all men, and especially of those who believe. Now that's, that's quite a tricky thing to, un, you know, because when he says the saviour of all men, well it can't possibly mean that all men are saved. And of course not, because we know that all men are not saved, all right. But then he says, who is the saviour of all men, so could that be all kinds of? It's just saying there that this all is all kinds of. Well, yeah, that would, that would really be good, for those who are maintaining that the predestination is the whole side of the story. But then he goes on to say, and especially of those who believe. So, so, so Paul is drawing a distinction here. Um, you know, that, that, that God can be the saviour of someone even though they don't believe. Now, that could mean two things. It could mean that he is their saviour in the sense that he has provided salvation for them. All they've got to do is believe and then they're in. It could mean that. Or it could mean that he's talking here about the fact that, you know, that el el elsewhere there's the, um, you know, the verse when it talks about that, you know, that God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. You see what I mean? And that God's mercies, even his delivering mercies, not from sin, but even his delivering mercies are seen in unbelievers. So it could be a reference to that. So all I'm saying is that with some of these verses that are pivotal, they're not necessarily as, as, as clear, you know, one way or the other. And for me on these verses, um, you know, sort of like, are they, are they saying that salvation is for everyone after all and that people aren't chosen to salvation? Or are they confirming that people are chosen to salvation? These verses have other applications. All I'm saying, for me, the jury is out on these verses still. So if the jury comes back, I'll let you know. But, um, you know, anyway, for me, the, the jury is still out. And talking about, you know, the thing about, you know, that, that verse when it says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust, all right? Remember it like this. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, but more, but, sorry, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, but less on the unjust fella. But that's just because the unjust one has just nicked the just one's umbrella. All right, so, so that's a good way of uh, remembering that. Anyway, then, verse 11, he says, command and teach these things. So, I mean, this is, you know, obviously, it's, it's, it's right and proper and fundamental to a biblical understanding of church life, that leadership in the church is not executive, i.e. it's not a question that you just do what the leaders say, you know, like the minister of the church or, you know, whatever it is. No, we, we see that churches govern themselves looking for the Lord to speak to the whole body, so that it was a, a collective consensual thing. 
Um, you know, so leaders would take the lead, but they weren't themselves the decision-making process. All right. They were part of it, but they weren't the process itself. Everyone was involved in that. But nevertheless, that doesn't mean that there's not strong leadership when it's needed. Because Paul writes to Timothy and says, look, command and teach these things. <coughs> you know, and he says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. And Timothy was young. And, uh, you know, what Paul is saying, look, don't let anyone bring you into disrepute just saying that you're young. Stand your ground, Timothy. You know what's right. You know what God's word is. Stick to it. And he says, but set an example in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Okay. So he says, Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because of your youth. Maintain the authority of God's word. Because this wasn't Timothy's authority. This was just Timothy standing on the word of God. That's where the authority comes from, you see. But he says, but also, Timothy, you've got to make sure that you're a living example yourself of the truth that you're passing on to others. And he says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. Because back then, obviously, most people couldn't read. And also, the Bible was just being passed around, you know, the New Testament was in fragments, a letter from Paul here, a letter from Peter there, all being passed around. So obviously, you know, sort of part of, you know, sort of what would happen when a church came together on the Lord's Day, if there was someone there who could read and there'd been another, you know, letter from Paul, then, then that person would read it out. So there you've got the public reading of scripture to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift. We were talking about this the other day, weren't we, from, from Andy. You know, whatever our gift is, don't neglect it. Stir it up. Serve the Lord, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. That would have been when Paul, you know, when, sorry, when uh, Timothy had received an anointing of the Holy Spirit to do the ministry God had called him to. And elders, wherever he was at the time, presumably the church he was part of when he was younger, had laid hands on him and then sent him out to, to be part of Paul's team. And then he says, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. And this is the important thing, even, even with leaders. You know, it's not just that, you know, leaders, you know, are kind of, you know, wanting obviously see, to see the progress of those they're leading. Those they're leading should be seeing their progress as well. Can you see what I mean? Again, it's not the leaders up here and the lead down here. Absolutely no way. The leaders are just brothers anyway. So it's a two-way thing. So the church is needed to be able to see that Timothy was growing in, in the Lord as well. And then Paul says, what your, watch your life and doctrine closely. So two things. Two things. Watch your life closely. That's how you're living. Holy life. But what else must you watch? Your doctrine. Now, where are we today? Doctrine doesn't matter. But that's where Satan is in the church big time. Can you see what I mean? We must watch our lives and we must watch our doctrine. If we're not believing the truth, we're not going to be set free. So you can't really live a godly life except to the extent that we understand what the Bible teaches anyway. <clears throat> so he says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So again, here we've got the thing, when you see the word save, don't just automatically think of being saved from the lake of fire. Paul is not here saying, Timothy, if you're faithful in doctrine and teaching, then you and your church are going to be saved. <laughs> or you and the churches you're with are going to be saved. No, he's saying that if you do this, you will be delivered from what? From false teaching. That's the point. So he's saying, to the extent that you stick closely to teaching the word of God, to that extent you're going to be delivered from the danger of the false teaching that Satan wants to get in amongst you. Okay, now then in, in chapter 5, um, Paul, Paul says that he mustn't rebuke an older man harshly. Now that's interesting, um, because that means that he could arguably rebuke a younger man harshly. Now, obviously, there'd be something real wrong if you had someone in leadership who was forever handing out harsh rebukes. Well, there'd be something wrong if you had someone in leadership who was forever handing out soft rebukes. You know, I mean, rebukes aren't there to just be handed out willy-nilly. But the point is, there are times, I mean, few and far between, but there are times when any individual might need a little bit of a rocket. You know, can you see what I mean? And so Timothy, as a younger man, had to be very aware that in any situation like that, he could never do that to someone who was older than him. Didn't mean he couldn't correct them or rebuke them, but it meant he had to do so as if it was to his own father. So incredibly respectfully. 
the, the, the older someone is than you, the greater the respect you ought to give them, especially, especially if it's to do with a correction. And then he says, treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Now, the next, the rest of this chapter covers who can legitimately be supported by giving in the churches and who shouldn't be. <clears throat> and he deals particularly with the issue of widows. Now remember, back then there was no social security system, there was no welfare, um, you know, sort of there wasn't a government looking after you if you fell on hard times. So the point is the church was very, very aware to make sure that if, if, you know, sort of, if anyone was in legitimate need, that the church was there for it. And remember, for widows, for a woman, if her husband died, very often that was the end of her. Where was she going to get money from? Who was going to look after her? <clears throat> and now the church absolutely insisted, and Paul makes this clear as you read the verses, that if those people had family, the family should look after them. But if they genuinely had no one to look after them, then it fell to the church. And so Paul would actually encourage the churches to have a list of the widows so everyone could know who were approved you know, for legitimately giving money to them, if you see what I mean. And, um, you know, they have to pass certain tests, and he says if they're younger widows, much better if they remarry, you know. So the point is that for a younger widow, if there'd have been someone who was happy to marry them, but the younger widow was refusing to get married again, then Paul would say, well, OK, fine, but you could be provided for, you know, elsewhere, but we're not going to support you as a church. But if people had no other way of being supported, then they'd be on the list. And uh, Paul would say, these are people to whom it's okay to give money. Um, and then the, the second... Um, now, hang on a sec. Yeah, the, the second set of people that he says it's okay to give money to are elders who have a full-time ministry. Most elders just had jobs, all right? So this is when Paul says, look, the elders who direct the affairs of the church, and that's a real bad translation, uh, the Greek word is proesme, it should read, the elders who care for the church, all right, um, are worthy of double honour, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. So now he's talking about elders who specifically are Bible teachers. And remember, in Ephesians 4, when Paul talks about the ministries that God gives to the church, you've got apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor, teacher. So elders, who are elders in one church, but they have a teaching ministry that is wider than one church. Right. So he says concerning them, he says the Old Testament said, don't muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. So the point is what Paul is saying, not that the church, I mean, the biblical churches don't employ anyone. There are no salaries for ministries in the early church. But all Paul is saying is that for Christians, as they consider, as they're asking, Lord, where do you want my giving to go? He's saying, here are two areas where it's legitimate for you to give money if you feel so led. To the widows and to full-time elder teachers. Okay. Um, he's not saying you've got to, and no one's asking. No one's asking, but he's just saying here are areas where it's good to give money to if you so believe that's okay. Then he says, and this is a tremendously important principle, that the, the, el the accusations against an elder are never to be entertained unless you've got two or three witnesses. Because the point is, obviously, elders, they do end up sorting out situations that most other people in the church don't. And so, obviously, they're always in the firing line. So the point is, it's easy for any disgruntled person in the church who's been corrected by an elder to accuse them of this, that, and the other. And the safety mechanism is simply that no accusations against an elder should even be entertained unless you've got two or three people as witnesses to each individual accusation. Okay. Now, elsewhere... In Corinthians, Paul says that's true of all believers, that no accusation will be entertained against anyone except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. But here he, he specifies it for <coughs> elders um, as well. And also he says that, that, that the elders, any elders that sin publicly are to be rebuked publicly because it's a harsher judgment for them. Do you remember when Paul the Apostle um, was with... Um, 
Peter. And you remember uh, up in Antioch with the Gentiles and the circumcision party came and Peter withdrew his fellowship from the Gentiles because the circumcision party came. What did Paul do? He rebuked P Peter in front of the whole church and told him he was a hypocrite. Absolutely right for so doing, because obviously Peter was an heir, he was a leader, so it was important that that was done. So obviously you've got to have safety mechanisms for anyone who is an elder, you can't just accept anything that anyone says about him, but on the other hand, elders are to be judged with greater strictness if they do get into sin. And James says in his letter that if you want to be a teacher, well understand that you're going to be judged with greater strictness, which is obviously fair enough. And then he tells him uh, not to, um, you know, to, to be showing favouritism and to keep all these instructions without partiality. Remember, the reason it's so important to go by Scripture is that if you do not accept that Scripture is your final authority, then what's going to win out is whoever can talk best or whoever makes the most noise or whoever's better at arguing. Do you see what I mean? And then you're enslaved you're, you're enslaved to partiality. Do you see what I mean? Whereas the point about when you go by the word of God, because the word of God is objective, it applies equally to absolutely everyone. So there's less likely to end up with favouritism and partiality. And then he says, don't be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. I think this is, again, referring to elders that don't too readily recognise someone. You know, if you lay hands on someone, you know, having recognised them as an elder, if you do it too hastily, then if, there, if there's serious stuff in their life that isn't dealt with and they're not qualified yet, if they become an elder, it's going to spill out everywhere. It's going to make a dreadful mess. Okay. Then he says, don't drink only water, but use a little wine because of your stomach and frequent illnesses. Um, and then he goes, I take it back to what he was saying about elders, that the sins of some men are obvious, but the sins of others trail behind them. So he's saying, look, there are some Christians with very, very obvious serious sins in their lives. He says, but well, there are other Christians with serious sins in their lives, but they're not that obvious. So he's saying, remember, make sure you really know this person well before you recognise him as an elder. Can you see what I mean? You, it, it's better to not have an elder, or, or it's better to not recognise another elder than to recognise someone who's not actually qualified. Okay, that's the, the basic principle there. Okay, right, then um, chapter 6, and he deals with um, the slaves, and he says that the slaves, and obviously he's talking about slaves in the church, should honour their, their masters and uh, respect them. Um, and he, he, he says that, that those slaves who've got you know, masters who are believers in the church as well, they're not to start thinking they can get away with a load of stuff just because their master's a Christian. So he says, look, you know, don't show less respect for them just because they're brothers. In fact, show more respect. And, um, and then he says, these are the things you are to teach and urge on them. So obviously they're the instructions that Timothy had to give to slaves. Um, now Paul goes into... Um, the thing about money, uh, remember we said that um, uh, that Jesus taught more about that one subject than anything else. Um, so in verse 3, Paul says, Look, if anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil uh, suspicions and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. So there's a bit of a broad side in regards to false teaching, uh, a good sign. You know, you know when someone is, is, is being drawn away, controversies, quarrels about words, strife, friction, contention, challenging everything. This is always the sign that someone's going bad in that regard. And he says this about you know godliness being a means to financial gain. Because of course in the ancient world, as today, you look at the televangelists, there was money to be made from being a religious teacher. And so that, that segues Paul now into talking to Timothy about money because there were lots of unscrupulous people. As I say, there was money to be made if you were a travelling religious teacher. 
and, and there's a lot of people, even genuine Christians, making fortunes out of the gullibility of God's people because they're men without conscience and they'll just use their personalities and their ability to teach and they'll just teach what people want to hear and then just screw the money out of them. And so then Paul starts to talk about money and he says godliness with contentment is great gain. Now think of it like this, he, he says now look, we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. So the point is, you came into the world stark naked, all right? Now, when you go out of the world, you won't even take your body with you. <laughs> you'll, you'll be even more naked than you were. I mean, you'll get a new body when the Lord comes. But the point is, we go out of this world even more naked than we came into it. And I always remember what Robert Lee used to say. And he said, you know, sort of like, it's like a game of, mono, you know, of Monopoly. And he says, when you die, you've, you've, you've got your board, you've got your house, your houses on this, that and the other. You've got your stations, you've got your hotels on Mayfair. And he says, you, you, you've got millions millions of pounds and everyone is having to give all their money to you because you're winning the game of Monopoly. You've got the lot. And he said, but when you die, it all goes back in the box yeah. <laughs> and you go out of this world without it. And that, that's what Paul is saying. So he says, look, you know, for heaven's sake, therefore, if we have food and clothing, let me, you know, we must be content with that. Now, here is a very important verse. This is so important. But you've got to understand what it is saying and what it isn't saying. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, let me make a statement. What Paul is saying here to want to be rich is sin. It's a sin to want to be rich. Now, he doesn't say it's wrong to be rich. We'll be on to that in just a minute. But he says it is a sin to want to be rich. And he says, because the love of money... So if you want to be rich, you've got love of money. And he says that's the... In, in the King James Version, it says it's the root of all evil. That's a bad translation. It's right here. What it's saying is that if you love money... There's no other sin you won't commit to get more of it. Do you see what I mean? That's why the love of money leads to so many other sins. And he says, look, people have wandered from the faith. Genuine believers who are following the Lord wander from the faith because they get tied up with love of money. And they're distracted by money. And they pierce themselves with many griefs. So there's a warning. To want to be rich is a sin. However... That's not to say that being rich is a sin. We'll be back to that shortly. And then in verse 11, there's a digression before he goes back to finishing, uh, finishing off about money. And he says, but you, man of God, flee from all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. He says, look, that's, you know, don't worry about getting more money. Get more of that. Put all your energy into getting all that. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And it's like, when he says take hold of the eternal life, he's not saying Timothy hasn't got it, but he's saying, look, you've got eternal life, you've got <coughs> Jesus. Now, what he's saying is, look, you know it's like when, when you just want to grab someone by the lapels. You see what I mean? When, when something is so important, you just want to take hold of them and say, now listen, all right? That's what Paul's saying, that Jesus should be so important that we're just wanting to take hold of him, you know, that, that he's our everything, and he, he's the reason that we're doing everything. And he says, uh, he says, in the sight of God, who gives life to everything, he, he says, I charge you, keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, whether, whether that's the appearing of the Lord as in when you die and he takes you home, or whether it's the appearing of the Lord as in the rapture, what he's saying is, look, this is the command. This is how we must live. Okay. And he says, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. See, so he's talking about God the Father there. We see Jesus. 
We see the Father in the face of Jesus, but no one has ever actually seen God the Father. And he says, to him be honour and might forever. That's the God with whom we have to do. And then he goes back and he says, command those who are rich. So now we get a command for those who are rich. We've heard that you mustn't want to be rich. That's a sin, all right? Now that would apply to the poor and the rich, all right? But now we get a command just for the rich. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. Because obviously if you've got a lot of stuff, if, if, you know, if you're well off, you can be arrogant. You can lord it over others. You don't have to, but you can. And it's horrible when we do that. He says, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with every, everything for enjoyment. So yeah, if, you, you know, if God has prospered you, there's nothing wrong in enjoying it but never lord it over others. And then he says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. So this is why I say, the Bible teaches it's a sin to want to be rich, but it's not a sin to be rich. Paul doesn't say, command the rich to give everything away so they're poor again. He doesn't say that. Nothing wrong with being rich. But he says, for those who are rich, then make sure that your generosity and your sharing is in proportion to your riches. So the richer you are, the more generous you ought to be when it comes to giving and when it comes to sharing with others. So nothing wrong with prospering. It's just a question of making sure that there is liberality and generosity in this. And he says, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So the point is, if you're wanting to be rich, if, that, if you love money, well, spiritually, you're going to end up in big trouble, all right? So it's a sin to want to be rich. However, if you are rich, be generous. Because if you're rich and you're not generous, then those riches will shipwreck you as a Christian. But if you're rich and you're faithful to the Lord and generous and giving with those riches, then you're storing up treasure of heaven. So arguably you're getting the best of both worlds there, which is just great. So money can be a blessing or a curse, but unless it's completely surrendered to the Lord, it will be a curse. And then he says, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Now that's two things. There are churches entrusted to his care. And no, I mean, he's not an elder, but he's acting as one until he's got the other elders sorted out, then Timothy will go back and rejoin Paul again. But the point is, whether it's Timothy or elders, yeah, guard what has been entrusted to your care, i.e. the churches, but also that deposit of truth. Guard the truth that you have to teach and pass on to others. Guard it. <coughs> because Satan's out to get it. He's out to get in there and twist it, distort it so that you end up teaching false teaching. And then, rather than blessing others, you'll actually be doing them a grave disservice. And rather than bringing them closer to the Lord, you'll end up shipwrecking them precisely with the false teaching you're teaching. And he says, back to the false teaching now, turn away from godless chatter and from the opposing idea of what is falsely called knowledge. And, and so much, when you hear Christians pushing their false teaching, it sounds so grand, it sounds so up there, doesn't it? But all the time, it's avoiding the verses, the clear statements of Scripture that they're trying to get round with it. So it's, it's all words, it's godless chatter. And he says, which some have professed and in so doing have wandered from the faith. So can you see Paul's theme here to Timothy? And this is something that obviously, by proxy, anyone who's an elder really does need to take all this on board. Because all the time, Satan is trying to get Christians to wander away from the faith without even realising they're doing it. They think they're still following the Lord, but in actual fact, they've been sidelined. And we're seeing the main way that Satan does that is through false teaching. But we've seen it can happen through the love of money. But the main push here in this is how wrong ideas, when we know better than God, you know, when we see things in Scripture that we don't approve of and we want to get round them and we want to get word out there that there's new revelation that even Paul didn't realise or even the writers of Scripture didn't realise. As soon as you're doing that, you've been sidelined and Satan has got you. You're wandering away from the faith. And so it's absolutely vital that all leadership, but not just leadership, all of us together, 
we're told in the scripture to admonish one another. It's not just for leaders, that's not just for elders. We guard each other and we guard each other from anything that can cause us to wander from the faith, be it the love of money or be it false teaching that gets in. And then he ends the letter by saying, grace be with you. And what's interesting about you there is that in the Greek, the you is plural. So even though Paul is writing to Timothy as an individual, he's obviously writing to Timothy expecting that this will be read out in the churches just like we're reading it out now. And therefore, although it's written to Timothy, it's addressed to all of us. Because this is truth that we all need to, to thoroughly understand. So here, in this letter to Timothy, and we carry on next time with 2 Timothy and looking at Titus as well, there's so much to do with how we guard ourselves as a church and help guard other churches from what Satan is all the time trying to do to undermine them and to get Christians to wander away from the faith. Boom, boom. <laughs>